Hey everyone, welcome back to RJK English. We are finishing up Siddhartha. So this is chapter 11. We just have chapter 12 after this. Once you're done, you will have read a whole book in English and you will have discussed, you will know how to discuss South Asian uh, culture and, um, I'm sorry, South Asian religion, especially Buddhism and some Hinduism. Um, you are also going to have experience analyzing a book and doing some literary criticism um, uh, in English. So it should be very useful. All right, let's get started here. Oh, before we start, make sure to like and subscribe. Co add a comment here. You can see uh, also see the name below, RJK English. Um, I have a Facebook page where you can um, also go and make comments and ask questions and I can help you out. All right, uh, let's get started. Om. So we've talked about what the Om is. I was talking with uh, some of my uh, Chinese and Taiwanese student today about the Om, um, where this came from. It is the basis of reality, the Om. When we do this, we are participating and connecting with the sound that is the basis of all reality. Let me on that. You guys all make the ohm. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Okay. Great job. I heard you. All right. Ohm. The wound smarted for a long time. Okay. This is older English. What does it mean for a wound to smart? It means that it hurt. You know, not very hard, not very bad, but it it hurt and came to your attention a lot. The wound smarted for a long time. Siddhartha took many travelers across the river who had a son or a daughter with them, and he could not see any of them without envying them, without thinking, so many people possess this very great happiness. Why not I? Even wicked people, thieves and robbers have children, love them and are loved by them, except me. So childishly and illogically did he now reason. So much had he become like the ordinary people. It's become like you or me. He now regarded people in a different light than he had previously. Not very clever, not very proud, and therefore all the more warm, curious, and sympathetic. That's describing him. He's not as clever, as proud, um, and he's therefore more warm and curious and sympathetic. Other people are this way. When he now took the usual kind of travelers across, businessmen, soldiers, and women, they, had, they no longer seemed alien to him as they once had. Remember that was a problem for him? Even for us, we felt he was a little bit of an alien. He did not understand or share their thoughts and views, but he shared with them life's urges and desires. Although he had reached a high stage of self-discipline and bore his last wound well, he now felt as if these ordinary people were his brothers. Their vanities, desires, and trivialities no longer seemed absurd to him. They had become understandable, lovable, even worthy of respect. There was the blind love of a mother for her child, the blind foolish pride of a fond father for his only son, the blind eager strivings of a young vain woman for ornament, meaning um, uh, you, you know, wearing jewelry, and the admiration of men. All these little, simple, foolish, but tremendously strong, vital passions, urges, and desires no longer seem trivial to Siddhartha. Vital. What does this mean? Vital comes from a Latin word uh, for life. And we often talk about vitality. This means you have the spark of life and strength of life in you. Um, vitals are inside of you, like your, your guts or your heart. These are your vitals. If you don't have them working, you can't live. So he's saying that all these simple, foolish things are also vital. They're necessary for real life. For their sake, he saw people live and do great things. Uh, for their sake, meaning these urges. He saw people live and do great things, travel, conduct wars, suffer, and endure immense, endure immensely, and he loved them for it. He saw life, vitality, and the indestructible 
and Brahman in all their desires and needs. Brahman uh, is Atman. That's the world spirit, right? The true reality. He's seeing them in these people. That's quite a difference. These people were worthy of love and admiration in their blind loyalty, in their blind strength and tenacity. With the exception of one small thing, one tiny little thing, they lacked nothing that the sage and thinker had. And that was the consciousness of the unity of all life, Brahman. And many a time, uh, and this is a colloquial saying, or I guess, I don't know if it's colloquial, we'll say many a time, uh, meaning many times, but, but indicating each time, like this time, that time, that time. So, and many a time, Siddhartha even doubted whether this knowledge, this thought was of such great value whether it was not also perhaps the childish self-flattery of thinkers who were perhaps only thinking children. You know, this idea of Brahman, is it really important? The men of the world were equal to the thinkers in every other respect and were often superior to them, just as animals in their tenacious, undeviating, undeviating actions in cases of necessity may often seem superior to human beings. So even here... <laughs> I don't know if it's Hermann Hesse. You know, he was a German writing in the late 1800s. Whether it's him or it's Siddhartha that still refers to people as animals. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So it seems like a backhanded compliment a little bit. Okay, up here, second page. Uh, what, within Siddhartha, there slowly grew and ripened the knowledge of what wisdom really was and the goal of his long seeking. It was nothing but a preparation of the soul, a capacity, a secret art of thinking, feeling, and breathing thoughts of unity. Okay. A secret art of thinking, feeling, and breathing thoughts of unity at every moment of life. That's what knowledge of wisdom is. Knowledge of wisdom is nothing but a preparation of the soul, a capacity a secret art of thinking, feeling, and breathing thoughts of unity at every moment of life. This is the statement of what he thinks wisdom is. This thought matured in him slowly, and it was reflected in Vasudeva's old childlike face. Harmony, knowledge of the eternal perfection of the world, and unity. But the wound still smarted. Siddhartha thought yearningly and bitterly about his son nursed his love and feeling of tenderness for him, let the pain gnaw at him, underwent all the follies of love, the flame did not extinguish itself. Do you notice it? it's not said that this is happening to Siddhartha, but that he's hanging on to it, on to it. So again, that goes back to the Buddhist idea of hanging on to pain through um, desire. But also there's the sense, I think, that Siddhartha is a higher being and that he could let it go, but he's not willing to let it go. I think, and you would have to say what you think, okay? I would love to hear what you think. Um, it seems that you need to feel these things in order to truly become human. And remember, Siddhartha's going through towards the Buddha. He might even become a Buddha at the end. He might become enlightened, and this experience leads him towards it, okay? So he let the pain gnaw at him, underwent all the follies of love. The flame did not extinguish itself. One day, when the wound was smarting terribly, Siddhartha rode across the river, consumed by longing, and got out of the boat with the purpose of going, down, going to the town to seek his son. The river flowed softly and gently. It was in the dry season, but its voice rang out strangely. It was laughing. It was a distinct, it was distinctly laughing. The river was laughing clearly and merrily at the old ferryman. Siddhartha stood still. He bent over the water to, in order to hear better. He saw his face reflected in the quietly moving water. And there was something in the reflection that reminded him of something he had forgotten when he reflected on it, uh, and when he reflected on it, he remembered. 
His face resembled that of another person, whom he had once known and loved and even feared. It resembled the face of his father, the Brahmin. He remembered how once as a youth, he had compelled his father to let him go and join the ascetics, and how, how he had taken leave of him, how he had gone and never returned. Had not his father also suffered the same pain he was now suffering for his son? Had not his father died long ago alone without having seen his son again? Did he not expect the same fare? Fare is usually um, like receiving of uh, uh, either payment or like you pay a fare to take the taxi or uh, food. So he gets the same payment for his life as he gave to his father. Was it not a comedy, a strange and stupid thing, this repetition, this course of events in a fateful circle? Here we go again, the circle and how it's comedic, you know, that we live and die and we keep coming back to the same place and we never really move on. The river laughed. Yes, that's how it was. So let's stop for a second and think about this. Remember, his father said to come back to him if he finds uh, enlightenment. He never went back to his father, ever. Isn't that strange? Well, how tragic. It never says in this that his father didn't love him. Siddhartha didn't love his son. I mean, he did kind of at the end, but he didn't want a son. His father loved him, and he never went back. There's something alien and a bit almost awful about Siddhartha. And he does realize it here. The river laughed. Yes, that's how it was. Everything that was not, that was not suffered to the end and finally concluded, everything that was not suffered to the end and finally concluded recurred and the same sorrows were undergone. Siddhartha climbed into the boat again and r rode back to the hut, thinking of his father, thinking of his son, laughed at by the river, in conflict with himself, verging on despair, and no less inclined to laugh aloud at himself and the whole world. The wound still smarted. He still rebelled against his fate. There was still no serenity and conquest in his suffering, of his suffering, conquest of his suffering. Yet he was hopeful, and when he returned to the hut, he was filled with an unconquerable desire to confess to Vasudeva, to disclose everything, to tell everything to the man who knew the art of listening. We're going to stop here. We'll start on uh, two, uh, part two next time. Okay, make sure to like and subscribe, and tell me what you think. Okay, I'd love to hear it. All right, see you next time.